want to say is I must commend my comrades on this panel, right? Because they do the hard work every day. Um, and the case that we're bringing is for Zimbabwean exemption permit holders, or ZDP, and it is a large group of migrants, right? 178,000 people. But what my comrades do on an everyday basis is a lot of hard work, and it's something that they do with real people on the ground, right? And so when I share the details of our case today, I hope you get two things from it. The first thing is just to understand better the case that we're bringing. The second thing is to hopefully highlight what this one demographic of migrants experiences is exactly what my comrades have told you on the panel that most, if not all, other migrants experience, right? Which is essentially a threat to their human rights. So let's talk about then the Zimbabwean exemption permit, or the ZEP. We go a little bit back in time. In 2008, 2009, there was some political instability in Zimbabwe, right? And this led to a lot of Zimbabwean nationals coming over to South Africa. The South African government at the time recognized the legitimate reason for the Zimbabwean nationals coming to South Africa. And so what they did is instead of each individual applying under the Immigration Act, as Donna has told you, for a special permit, the government gave them a broad-based permit, a new category of permit, right? They called this permit the Zimbabwean Exemption Permit. It was granted to roughly about 200,000 people at the time in 2009. Many of these people were fleeing Zimbabwe for political reasons, right? Because they were, being, they were afraid of being persecuted politically. And so since 2009, in the number of years that followed, right, in the next decade or so, um, every time the exemption expired, the government would renew it, every five or so years, all right? And so you go through three iterations or three versions of the Zimbabwean exemption permit until you get to the version that we know today. The version that we know today was meant to expire at the end of 2021, right? And so prior to this, people who held the permit thought that the permit would be renewed. After all, they'd been staying here for the last 10 or so years, and the government had renewed it every time, right? And so I want to pause there quickly, and I want to ask you, what have you been doing for the last 10 years? Think back on your own life, right? Whatever you've been doing is very likely the same thing that these permit holders were doing in those last 10 years, right? Since 2009. They were living their lives, they were forming communities, right? They were forming families, getting married, having children, right? Sending those children to school, some who were studying, right? Some were finding jobs, working, some people starting their own businesses, and even employing other people, right? They were living normal lives, just like everyone in this room. And so, we come back to 2021. The end of December 2021, the government says that they've decided to terminate the Zimbabwean exemption permit, and that 178,000 people, which is maybe 10 times more people than people in this room, right? have to now have one year to leave the country and go back to a place they haven't been to for the last decade, right? And you must remember, many of these people, like I said, have children. Some of those children have never been to Zimbabwe. They don't even know what that's like. All they've ever known is South Africa and the country we have here, right? So the minister then announces the termination of the Zimbabwean exemption permit at the end of 2021. And he says that there's a grace period of one year for Zimbabwean exemption permit holders to try and either legalize their status through another way, through the Immigration Act, right? To make another new application um, under the various categories or to return to Zimbabwe. So there's two things I wanna talk about here. The first thing is the decision. The second thing is the grace period. Let me first talk about the decision, right? The decision is essentially what our case is about. So under the Constitution, or rather in the Constitution, we all have the right to just administration, right? Or fair administration. And what that means is that it gave rise to the promotion of access to justice, a just administration, right? Which is called PADA, 
But essentially what that means is that every time there is an act or an exercise of public power, there are certain rules in that act that that official has to abide by, right? So, for example, when the Minister of Home Affairs took the decision to terminate the Zimbabwean exemption permit, he had to follow the rules set out in the act, which is our law, right? One of those laws is that you have to have public participation with the group around which your decision involves, all right? So it means that the minister had to talk to permit holders about the decision he was taking. He had to hear their stories, hear why it would be a good thing for them, why it would be a bad thing, how any decision he took would affect and change their lives, right? Our case is simply that he didn't do this, right? Which means that he went against the rules and he took a decision then that is unlawful. And so it means then that the decision is not valid, right? And that's essentially what our case is. The minister's response is that he didn't terminate. It's either two things, right? It's either that he didn't terminate it, he didn't end it, he gave them one year of grace period, right? Um, to come and to talk to him or make representations, right? That would be the public participation. But the problem is, when you tell people you have to, they have to go at a certain point, that means that you've already made up your mind, right? Because they know that they have to leave at a certain date. It's not like, this is the date, but I might change my mind if you make good representations. That's not what the Zimbabwean exemption permit holders were told, right? They were told that come what it should have been the end of last year, the end of December 2022, you need to either have found an alternative way to stay in the country or you have to leave, right? Alternatively, what the minister is saying, and then if he hasn't terminated it, right, let's just believe him that he hasn't terminated uh, term sorry, so we, we're saying that he has terminated it, right? But the problem is when you make representations, when you speak to the minister or your official about the decision he's making, it has to be done before the decision is made, right? So if he made the decision at the end of 2021, and then he speaks to people afterwards, that's still against the rules, right? That still undermines public participation under PACHA. And so we said that the minister can't have it both ways. We believe the minister has terminated, and in that termination, it's unlawful. So that's what our case is kind of about, essentially. Um, and I'm happy to take questions on it afterwards. The second part I want to talk about is the grace period that was given initially for one year, so it would have been the whole of last year. But towards the end of last year, the minister then extended it up until June of this year, right? And I think this part then speaks more to what my comrades have spoken about, right? Which is the difficulties that migrants face with the uncertainty of knowing what their legal status is, right? And that's exceptionally hard. We get calls every day about people saying their bank accounts are being frozen because the banks don't know if the government has said they're allowed to stay or not. Right? We don't, their children don't know if they'll be able to finish their entire year at school because as of now, right, they're only allowed to be in the country until the end of June this year. Right? So it might mean that halfway through the year children have to leave school. Right? People have businesses like I've told you. They've been building their businesses for the last decade. And how are they meant to just close that up in one year, right? People have been paying long-term insurance, people have pensions, right? They've built their entire lives here and it can't just be closed in one year, which is actually quite a short time or even 18 months. And I think that's then the second part of what it's like having a threat against your human rights, right? That uncertainty of not knowing being unable to do things because bigger institutions than yourself, right, feel that you don't deserve certain things based on this one thing, which is essentially not what human rights should be, right, and I think what the entire panel has said today. Um, so then, closing on that, our case will be heard in April, so in a few weeks' time, um, at the Pretoria High Court from the 11th to the 14th of April. 
Um, we are looking forward to hearing the case, um, or the case being heard, because it was meant to be heard at the end of last year, and then because of so many people wanting to join the case, it was postponed to this year. Um, we hope to get a quick judgment, because obviously the urgency is that when you hear the case in April, the looming deadline of the end of June is still there. And it should be noted that one of the reasons why the minister decided to push back the 30th of June deadline, right, or rather the December deadline to June this year, was because the system couldn't handle the amount of people who were applying to find alternative means, right? They were simply not going to get through the applications fast enough to give people an answer to the applications before the deadline, which is part of the reason why it was extended. And part of the problem that the panel has said here today, right, is that the system is just incredibly slow, and sometimes we're not sure if it works the way it should at all. Um, I think that kind of covers everything I want to say with regards to the case. I'm happy to take questions more and engage with people if we have time for that.